Welcome to this one and only lecture by me, Jamie. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to be talking all about small groups. And by dealing with small groups, we are going to be looking at essentially what a small group is, why do we need them, how do you do them, and then some uh, practical tips for starting small groups in your church. Um, the goal of this lecture is for you to come away with an understanding of exactly what small groups are, how to use them, and how to start them in your church. So let's start right off the bat with just a simple question of what are small groups? I know small groups can take many shapes, take many sizes. There's many different theologies and ideas of small groups. So it's really important just to understand the general basis of what is a small group. So to illustrate this, it comes from an idea of one, a small group is an intentional gathering, meeting regularly for the purpose of joining God's mission. This means that this group of people agree to share life together. They plan where and when to meet and arrange their schedules to be there. They have a purpose for getting together. That's that intentional gathering from the definition as they are purposefully switching around everything in their schedule just to meet. And then a small group has a regular meeting time and schedule. The group knows when to expect their next meeting. That goes along with not the intentional gathering, but the meeting regularly. And then people in small groups desire to be formed as Christ's disciples. And as such, they will naturally join in God's mission. This right here is essentially saying the purpose of joining God's mission. That the overarching idea in this definition is that a small group is an intentional gathering, meeting regularly for the purpose of joining God's mission. That they're wanting to be there. They meet on a consistent basis, all for the purpose of joining in God's mission. That, that, that is the overarching theme of what is a small group. Another definition, this one comes from Ed Stetzer in his book, Planning Missional Churches. He says this, he says, The overarching purpose of small groups is discipleship, to connect the individuals to the church of God that is being transformed into the image of God and participating in the mission of God. That, that the, the whole purpose of small groups should be to build up the disciples, to discipleship, to build the disciples, to build the church. So they then grow closer together, they grow in the church, they grow more in the image of God, and ultimately in the mission of God. That They are all trying to become more like Christ to then go out and fulfill his great commission to his calling that he gives each one of us. So that kind of covers the what of small groups. So now let's look at the why. Why have small groups? Why do we need small groups? And, well, according to to this, it says that small groups foster close relationships and integral communities, that small groups of people, like just a small number of people, like five, ten people, a small group of people help make the relationships together built stronger. And you can see this just as a normal, you don't have a hundred best friends, you have one to two best friends, you have four to five close friends. And so when you walk into a church, you're not best friends sharing life, doing everything together with every single person in that church building. So the smaller groups, the smaller number of people help foster a close relationship. We then go to small groups provide a comfortable introduction for non-believers to the Christian faith that if you've ever tried to invite a non-believer, a non-churched person, one of your friends to church, they might look at you and be like, bro, I don't need church. That's dumb. But it's so much easier to invite a non-believer to, say, a small group meeting because they're like, well, it's not church. You're, you're simply asking them to go and eat dinner and just be with you and then at the end have a little Bible discussion and be able to share Jesus with them. So it's a, it's a easier transition period to get non-believers from no church to some church to then hopefully get them from no church to some church to then from some church to church. And then another great thing for small groups. The small groups provide a way for Christians to live out their faith instead of merely hearing more preaching or teaching. That So many times we see small groups as being just a Bible teaching time, but that is not what it's meant to be. Instead, it allows people to take what the Bible says and to use it in everyday life. Not just an that way they're not just hearing another Bible sermon, but instead they're actually physically interacting with the Word of God and taking it and applying it to their everyday life, not just saying, oh, well, the Bible says that we should not kill people. No, instead they read 
the passage and say, well, killing people can mean more than just me walking up and stabbing the person. And so maybe I shouldn't be hateful and mean towards that one person or have those evil thoughts towards the person that cut me off in front of me when I'm driving down on business 40, right? So it allows them to actually take the Bible, take the passage and apply it to everyday life, not just, you know, hearing a passage for like the fourth time. And so according in uh, the book, Exponential says this, from the very beginning, God's dream was to satisfy our relational, emotional, and spiritual needs through community. That from the very beginning of time, this is Genesis chapter three here, that God's entire purpose was to fulfill all of our needs, both the relational needs, the emotional needs, and the spiritual needs, all of them in community. And so how do we do community? Well, small groups is a form of doing community. Small groups allows you to be with that group of people, to be with a group of people, to have community with one another, to then help fulfill each other's needs through different avenues, through the relational needs, through emotional needs, through spiritual needs. It allows us to fulfill all of that. So now that we have the what and we have the why, now let's look at the how. How do we do small groups? What does it look like? Um, Dr. Henry Cloud in his book, Making Small Groups Work said this, he said, one truth, that has emerged from the small group movement is that there is no one right way to do small groups, that there is no one correct way. It's not this way or the highway, essentially, that there's not this way works, no other way works, and we can't do it any other way. He said it's not like that, that that there is no one right way to do small groups. So because of that, there's many different models. Um, Talking about many different models, we have uh, actually five different models we're going to look at and kind of talk about and discuss a little bit of the benefits and the disadvantages of the five different models. Um, according to Dustin Connors and his uh, essay on the five different models of small groups, he says that we have one, the life transformation groups. Life, transform- life transformation groups are essentially two to three people. They meet together to discuss the scriptures, to discuss the, the Bible, and to talk about accountability and other questions like this. Um, The groups are typically separated by gender. So, you know, you'll have men together and you'll have women together separated by the gender. And then the curriculum that they go through is all about the Bible. Now, the problem with this group, the problem with the style is that it typically works better when it's added on to, say, one of the other small group models. It's, It's not your sole small group model, but it's it's an add-on to what you have. You, you can use it as just your small group model, but it usually works better if you have this model and then you have two to three people that say, well, let's meet together and start our own little transformation group out here to then continue to grow. So it, it, it works better as a complementary piece rather than the entire piece, but that is life transformation groups. Then the second model that we have for small groups is out of Sunday schools, what you have in almost every Baptist church around the country, right? Sunday schools. Sunday schools, essentially, they meet they meet together before or after the service, um, depending on when you have service times. Sometimes if you have service at, say, like a 9.30 or a 9 o'clock, you might have a 9 o'clock service, 10 o'clock Sunday school, and then a 11 o'clock service, so people can get service in Sunday school or Sunday school in service or maybe all three, but that they usually meet before or after. Uh, Sunday schools can range anywhere from two to three people to over 100 people in one class. Uh, The number for the Sunday school essentially depends on the size of your church and the amount of people you have. If you only have 50 people, well, you're not going to have 100 per class, right? So it usually depends on that. Um, The small groups are, or the Sunday schools, excuse me, are usually led by a teacher. And the biggest strength in the Sunday school is that it is the Bible teaching aspect, whereas the biggest weakness of the Sunday school is the community and relational side of the group. So then that that takes care of Sunday school. So now the next group, and this is probably the one that people think of the most when they think of small groups, is that of life or community groups, life groups, community groups, whatever your preference is. And these groups are typically five to 20 people per class or per group. So they're a smaller size. They can get a little bigger, but 5 to 20 is right around the perfect time. Um, in this group, you have a regular meeting time that is usually either at somebody's home or it's at a public space, say like a Starbucks or, uh, you know, a Cranky's Coffee, somewhere like that, even a Wendy's. <laughs> and uh, in these groups, 
the curriculum that they use um, varies widely depending on the leader of the group and what the group dynamic is. It can go anywhere from sermon-based, where they're talking about what was said on Sunday morning, taking what the message on Sunday was and breaking it down and really how do I apply this message to my everyday life. Um, they can go through themed curriculums, maybe through a book or through video series or whatever it may be, or just simply a theme, like say money. Um, they can just go through the Bible. They'll take a book in the Bible and they'll break through it in 12 weeks and say, we're really going to dig deep into the book of Romans or First John or James or whatever book of the Bible they would go through. Or they can even be devotional based, meaning they go through, like say a book, a devotional book. Um, when it comes to life and community groups, they are either one of two ways, usually geography based. So where you live depends on what group you're in, or they can be age based. So like uh, young adults, like a 20 to 25 year old group, a high school group, a, a older adults, a seniors, it can be broken up in different ways. They're typically not gender based, even though they can be, they're usually not um, in the in the groups, they have leaders, and then they also have co-leaders. The leader is taking the co-leader under like an apprentice, and the co-leader is being groomed to start a new group. And then uh, in these groups, they can break off into those life transformation groups. Remember the life transformation groups we said they usually work better as a complementary and not the whole, so they can break off into that. So that's that's the life or community groups. We then have the cell groups here. The cell groups are one of the more different approaches to small groups. Again, any small group works. There's no correct way. It's just a little different way of thinking about it. Uh, cell groups, they see themselves as an actual individual house church. So they're typically three to 15 people. And in this semi house church style, their whole point is seeking to fulfill the great commission. Um, they typically will take communion together. They will baptize together and they see themselves as an individual church while still being part of the bigger church. So that's cell groups. And then the last one is missional communities. Missional communities, they uh, can be viewed like the life groups. And in these groups, they're typically five to 20 people or even 20 to 50 people. It just depends on the group and the size. Um, what's special about this group compared to others is that they actually involve the entire family. They involve the whole family, not just say like the adults in the family or the high schoolers that is an entire family based and uh, they're less strict about the meeting time about when they meet the regular meeting times and they primarily focus solely on the mission of god uh taking missions out into the community helping the community serving the community so that's typically what they focus on so now the last little bit i want to transition to is just tips for starting small groups so the first thing that I have comes from the book Activate, and it is this. How do I, it was this question of we need to ask the right question. Is it how do we get people to re-sign up for groups, or how do I get new people to sign up? And we should be asking the question, how do I get new people to sign up? Because we should be focusing on growth of the groups, not the retention of the group. If the group is going good and the, everything is working in it, we don't need to worry about people re-signing up. But instead, we need to always focus on the growth where it always should be looking to say, how do we get the people that weren't involved in the community group or the small group to instead get involved next? Um, the next thing that I think is very good when it comes to starting small groups is the steps for leadership. So how do we take a leader? You know, you have the leader and then the co-leader, the apprentice. How do we get the apprentice to go from a, just an apprentice to then a new leader? And uh, these steps came from Nathan Klein, where he said that we need to take this approach where it says, first, I lead and you watch. So the leader leads and the co-leader watches. He's, he observes. And then I lead and you help that the leader leads and the co-leader is helping. And then we both lead. We're both involved in it. And then it starts to switch and it says, you lead and I help. So now you're taking over and I'm helping. And then you lead and I watch. And then I start to just watch you while you do it. And then the last step is then to start over with someone new. So then the co-leader that was the co-leader is now going to become a new leader. And then both leaders will then find a new apprentice. So that's the steps for leadership. And then the last thing I think for small groups that is very big is the three semesters. This idea came from Jay McGurick. And he said this. He said that small groups should be 
in three essential semesters um, that we should be running small groups as a semester base, meaning that we have a specific start time and a specific end time to each group with some time in, be time at, in between the start, in between the finish and the next start. And he said this, this really helps people because it makes them feel like they're not signing up for something that, you know, is until the end of time, I have to be a small group leader. No, it says that it allows people to have a specific start and end time. Because of this, you'll have A, people that are more likely to just sign up for your group because they know that there's going to be an end. And then B, you're more likely to get leaders because again, they know that they're not signing up to be a leader until they die. They're signing up for a leader until October 1st. And then if they can do it again, they can do it again. If not, then it's okay because the whole purpose is to build leaders. And then the last thing, the fourth thing on tips for starting small groups is uh, the three questions we should ask when discussing the Bible. These came from Jason Ledford, and it was this. The first one, when we're discussing the Bible, the Bible should be all discussion-based. It shouldn't be a teaching format. This is not a depending on what small group you're using, what model you're using, depends on how you're teaching it. But we should always be looking to answer these three questions. The first one is this. What does it teach about God? What does the passage we went through actually teach about God? What does it say? What does it show about God? How does it teach about God? The second one is this. What does it teach about sin? What does it show us about sin? But how does it in some way relate to sin and teach about sin? What, the, what does it teach about sin? How does this passage directly show something about sin? And the last thing was this. How does this passage point to Jesus? How, how does this passage, whatever, whatever it may be, whether it's a Old Testament passage talking about the law, or it is a passage specifically mentioning the name Jesus, how, how does this passage point to Jesus in one way or another? It might not be a perfectly direct way, but how does it point to Jesus? Um, this is everything on small groups class. I hope it, I hope it helped you. I hope it gave you a new understanding of what small groups are and, uh, Hope you have a blessed week. Bye.